podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode, which I think is 133, Bob, but I might be wrong. No, I think it's 123. Do you reckon? It might oh, no, be. No, sorry. No, it must be 130. I don't know. I don't Not either. Person. Always, I've always relied on you, Jackie, because you say, welcome to wonderful Bob Cook, and then you keep the count. Well, I'm going to commit to this being episode 133. Okay, I'm going to go with that. I like that. I, yeah. That's and what we're going to be talking <laughs> about in this episode of the therapy show behind closed doors is what are the most successful elements in the therapy process or what we believe are the most successful elements in the therapy process? Well, I'll start off. You Can start I? off. Love. I like that. And compassion. I like that as well. We could go on and on and on, but without an open heart, without compassion and kindness for ourselves and for the person sitting opposite us, not much will happen. No. And I like the way you said for ourselves as well, because I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. well, I agree with you. Without that for ourselves. Yeah as well as for the person sitting opposite us, not much therapy will happen. No. I really believe that. Which, we... for me, I think it is so important as therapy <clears throat> that we do do work on ourselves. Oh, all the great therapists have undertaken a lot of the therapeutic work on themselves. I love the fact, Bob, and I really <clears throat> admire <clears throat> you because you go on retreats quite regular. You, yeah, I'm going, yeah, I've just been on one. You spend time on yourself, and that's something I've always found quite difficult, personally, to carve out time just for me. Well, this is a retreat. Well, my retreats you're talking about, the one in November I've just been on, was um, 13 years I've been going on, twice a year, which was mostly the same people, is a personal development week, really. It's aimed at reflections and thoughts and internal meanderings. I love that. <clears throat> I love to just take the time to have those meanderings and personal development. And no offence meant at all with this, Bob, but for somebody of your age, 73, is it now? Yes, 73. To still be taking time for personal development and meanderings and 13 <laughs> years have you been doing this for yeah, twice, twice a year? Twice a year, yeah. Yeah. See, that's that's true commitment to yourself, that is. Yeah, and I think in the therapeutic process, I learn, I've learned that I wouldn't be, and first of all, I wouldn't be the therapist that I am today without my own therapy and with these this sort of meanderings if you like yeah and i think that's the least i can give to the person opposite me because i think that was one of my thoughts about successful elements is you know personal development i know we're on continuous professional development and those sort of things that it's not just doing the training once and that's it for the next 20 or 30 years? You know, I think it's a really hard one for people coming into this profession. And maybe if I go back to, no, it's not true of me because I was so, so I was so much of my own history to explore. Therapy was a lifeline for me. So I, I, I went into therapy every week for the duration of the four, five, six, seven years. So I remortgaged my house to be able to do these things. Now, I'm not saying everybody goes to that length, but, you know, I've been running these trainings at the Institute for the last 37 years. And I've never, and I know we're in an economic downturn at the moment and crisis around cost and everything else. But, but the, the trainees and students that come on the course who 
on our course, you have to do 160 hours. Yeah. It's not therapy. That's 40 hours a year. I don't know who put that figure on it, but anyway, <clears throat> with four fours, 160, I suppose. Uh, and there's always this um, stipulation of everything they've done this these therapy, and and I know it's costly, but I do know that the best psychotherapists are the therapists that have done their own work. Yeah, there is no doubt about that. I None. agree. Yeah, and it's ongoing as well because life happens. Do you know to eat, eat? Yeah. Oh. So I suppose it is probably the a, a very important element for successful therapy. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. And with that, it's really a gift to your clients. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And modeling again. I know we spoke in the last podcast about, you know, modeling positivity and that sort of stuff. But prioritizing ourselves and taking care of ourselves is a really good thing to model to our clients mm, mm. and the therapists that don't do this by the way and in the counseling world i think of the bacp which is a regulating body they don't require you to do any mm. hours at the present moment of reflecting on yourself and i mean a lot of courses um say look you've got to do 20 hours or 30 hours or whatever it is but the biggest problem you know not only don't you know yourself if you don't do your own therapy but quite often you you merge with your you merge with your clients if you don't know yourself yeah so a depressed client comes in yeah and part of yourself is depressed but you don't really really i don't know understand it or deny it or disavow it so you can end up identifying with your clients and then you end up merging with your clients nothing much happens really mm. which is a danger of that anyway if you're not very self-aware as a, a, a therapist is that you know over identification <laughs> or whatever yeah absolutely but self-care knowing yourself yeah very important isn't it the love and the compassion and everything. Yeah, I like that. One of the other things I think, and I know that you've touched on this previously when you're doing assessments, is to ask the support network that people have got. Mm. I think that's kind of one of the, the, the elements for success is that the client has a, a positive support network around them outside of the therapy room as well. Yeah, and that's not necessarily going to talk about the therapy. No. It's about just making that clear. It's about having people who will be on your side. Yes. Take account of you and be able to go to the pictures with or play tempted yeah. bowling with or if you feel really hopeless because of whatever, you can phone them up or yeah. you're not isolated, withdrawn and stuck in, in some place where you've only got the devils in your own head. Yeah. Because I think there's some, and maybe it's just, I don't know, the world that we live in now, but the, the, there's a lot of my clients that have toxic people around them that have a massive impact on the recovery in the therapy process. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the process encourages them to maybe limit their exposure to certain people, put it that way. <laughs> which absolutely. again is another way of self-care it's taking care of yourself yeah absolutely I, and we're in the period of festivity at the moment with christmas mm. now, of yes and it's uh, worth mentioning <laughs> yeah well i was thinking of support mechanisms yes quite often therapists take a week off yes yeah 10 days over christmas and clients without those support mechanisms are often alone in their own heads over this time yeah so it is important it's a vital question to ask any clients you take on board about their support mechanisms yeah because this time of year isn't always a, a you know a happy festive time for for everybody there's a lot of people that are you know on their own 
and you know when the therapist which we, you know we are absolutely entitled to take a break just like everybody else does it, it is something that we need to be mindful of oh we need to always be mindful of it and i said on a podcast a year ago i think and i don't know what it was about perhaps it was last christmas so i'm, Maybe. Perhaps I'm in the same story but you know when you hear i hear stories of a therapist who put up christmas trees in their in their office yeah they put up you know thousands of baubles and and i was thinking actually if a supervisor you put up a christmas tree and xxx because they wanted to make sure that uh, in their their thinking the clients would have good christmases i know the intention of that mm. a positive intention however for a lot of clients the therapists see they've not had good christmases absolutely yeah they have a therapist attempt to force that down their being actually mm. produces the opposite effect of what the therapist intended to do yeah yeah and i think therapists need to explore the reality of people's Christmases in their own past and how that forms how they are Christmas today. Absolutely. And the material side of things, going right back to flipping <clears throat> September, it's in it's everywhere. It's in your faces. You go around, you know, your local supermarket in the middle of September and they're playing Christmas carols and the selection boxes are out on the shelves. It goes on for a long time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that doesn't mean, you know, um, not celebrating. Um, but it, I think it's important to honour the clients in front of you in terms of their own histories. Yeah. And not attempt to somehow foist your own, maybe as positive Christmas as it wasn't in my case, onto the clients in front of you. Yeah. Would you have the conversation with clients on the run up to Christmas? Always. Okay. 100%. Yeah. I'd always have a conversation about what was your past Christmas is like and uh, how did you cope and was it a good time for you? How do you want me to be over Christmas? And especially if you're running a side. The really good one, Bob. Yeah. How do you want me to be over Christmas? Yeah. To ask them. Yeah. 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 To get their reality, not yeah. to force society's reality on them yeah um one other thing about when you were talking about you know elements to make up a successful psychotherapy process in a way um i think celebration what i mean by that when people make changes which are positive yes and they integrate those changes i think it's really important to take time out to celebrate with them and to encourage them to celebrate themselves their their achievements yeah i don't think we do that enough as grown-ups <laughs> no. i think once we leave school do you know what i mean and we've stopped having congratulation assemblies and all those sorts of things i don't think we congratulate ourselves enough at all no quite often people are so focused up, uh, focused, focused on going up the mountain. Yeah. They stop on or the next uh, mountain when they're all, you know, they come halfway down one. They're already focusing on going up the next one. <laughs> yeah. So I always encourage clients to celebrate even the smallest changes and take ownership of what they've achieved. Yeah. yeah. I like that. So I think that's successful in the journey of. A psychotherapy treatment yes you're getting them to take ownership of the positive options that they've chosen instead of keeping with their blueprint of what often is a destructive script yeah and i think you know one of the things that make up <clears throat> successful elements in the the therapy process is is having a, a plan <laughs> Do you know, sometimes people go to therapy and I don't feel like there is a a plan. I've got on my initial form that clients fill out, 
you know, there's why are you coming to therapy and what are you hoping to get from therapy? And I'll often go back and refer back to that statement that, you know, this is what you were looking to get from therapy. Whereabouts are we now in that, you know, mm. vision that you had? I really agree. A plan. Yeah. It's short where you're at. Yes. Yeah. And Have feedback it. from the clients as well. You know, whereabouts do you feel you are, you know? Yeah, and it's, instead of just going on forever without some review of contracts. Yeah, yeah. Because things change. <laughs> what they what they originally come with isn't necessarily what they want. <laughs> we we know that. You, but it, it's it's a checking process, I think. Definitely. Other other elements, mistakes. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I think that it's very very important. At the right time in the psychotherapy sequence. So I'm not talking about, you know, us foisting things into the time process of a psychotherapy treatment. But I think it's important for the therapist to fall off the perch for the client. Yes. In other words, for a successful psychotherapy treatment, there has to be a very strong relationship at the beginning. The therapist needs to be more potent in the negative interject they need to be a figure where the person the client can respect and have as a mentor and stand up to the parents in their heads and they also need to make mistakes and they need to fall off the perch so that the client can take an equal power dynamic in that relationship yeah in client otherwise they could go they could leave therapy and be a copycat of Bob Cook for the rest of their lives, which which might be slightly better, but it's still not them taking an ownership of themselves. So the therapist does have to fall off the curb and also make mistakes, which is what everybody does in any human relationships. Yeah. Because one of the worst tyrannies of psychotherapy is the so-called, in inverted commas, perfect psychotherapist it's it's a it's a difficult one <laughs> <laughs> because I'm smiling because i was thinking what's difficult about that but anyway. well you know it's easy to make mistakes yeah. i do it quite often bob but what i'm thinking is you know dependent on the type of mistake that's made and the rupture that that could potentially cause in the relationship it's a really good way of modeling coming back from something like yeah, that. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. But exactly like you said at the beginning of this, the timing needs to be. Oh, that's why I said in it. In order to be able to come back from that. That's why. Yeah. We're talking about later on in psychotherapy. Absolutely. Yeah. It has to be a very strong working relationship between therapists and clients. Yeah. They've had to go through the sequences I've talked about. And there has to be like yin and yang. There has to be some equalizing up eventually. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't have any equality of human discourse. Yeah. And I like that. I like that even in an equaling up type of thing, that I'm okay, you're okay. There's no one upmanship yeah. and all that sort of That's stuff. Right, because That's most of your clients will have had a, an experience, a power dynamic in their histories mm. when the parent or significant other came from I'm okay you're not okay position I was discussing this with somebody this week and it's it's really something personally that's been going on for me that power dynamic with my oncologist and oh, it's, it's yes. replaying stuff yes. from my past and parental dynamic and it, it's really interesting that I picked up on the fact that it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And often authority figures. Yeah. Without even intending that process for whatever reasons. Oh, I think he intends it, Bob. I think he intends yeah. it. <laughs> I'm not getting caught up in your. No, let's not. Uh, your history. But I was thinking of um, authority figures who step in that position may intend it, you know. And also, because of their own script, yeah, might be unaware of the impact of that position on the other. 
Yes, yeah, yeah. But in a psychotherapy treatment which needs to be successful, which I believe where, you know, the client needs to be encouraged to take ownership of their own importance and their own destiny, there needs to be, I believe, some equality and discourse between the therapist and the clients mm. and not a one-up, one-down position, which is often their experience of their history. Yeah, and I think I, I don't, I you know, I don't think I'm making assumptions here when I say that often clients come into the therapy process being one down. They, they, they're looking up to you as soon as they walk in through the door that you've got all the answers and, and everything. Yeah. yeah, usually. I mean, get back to the festive spirit, if you like. I call that a particular phenomena, which is a Father Christmas phenomena. Mm. They come in expecting the therapist to be Father Christmas and pull a magic trick out of the... It used to frighten the life out of me that when I first started being a the therapist that I was expected to have all the answers and yeah. I knew I didn't have them. Yeah, yeah. and I, I understand it would frighten you and it takes some experience to be able to understand that as yeah. an important part of psychotherapy process and to be worked through and that's what I meant is the therapist that either hopefully consciously needs to understand that the client needs to have the therapist fall off the perch yeah yeah psychologically and the therapist needs to allow that to happen yeah and not take it personally and the therapist oh, yeah. is ego driven i was just going to say that's when our ego the needs to get out of the way <laughs> highly narcissistic yeah may not allow that to happen and that's would be in my view a professional tragedy mm. Yeah, it's a humbling, it's a, a it, you know, the, the whole process of the cycle of that, you know, Father Christmas thing to, you know, building a relationship to falling off the perch to, you know, fixing the rupture or whatever. That's mm. like a wonderful cycle to be a part of with somebody. It's, it's wonderful. And for a narcissistic therapist, it could be very painful. So that's why narcissistic therapists, I think, well, if you've done your own therapy, maybe you can move away from that narcissistic position. Yeah. Because otherwise, there's no room for the clients in the whole therapeutic treatment. So I think it's another reason for insisting on trainee therapists having their own therapy. Yeah, yeah. Because they have to fall off the perch. I believe in that equal yin and yang process we're talking about. Yeah. A lot of therapy goes wrong. I don't like right and wrong. But, well, I'll say, I'll you say wrong for the sake of language at the moment. You can say it, Bob. We all yeah. know each other. Yeah. It goes wrong when you get the narcissistic therapist who gets so wounded when. I think it's a psychological necessity of the client if the treatment's successful to see the therapist in a human light mm. for. But there's a wounding for the therapist to narcissistic level and they can't bear it. So they then um, do something or act out in a way where the all the good therapy work has been destroyed. And that is a sad tragedy on a personal and a professional level for both the therapist and the client. Yeah, I can imagine. Because it usually means that the client then starts to replay their own script of a, a power dynamic which has been so unhealthy for them. Yeah. I, for me personally, I, I find it helpful and empowering and encouraging and all that to have somebody that's just a few steps ahead of me in any new skill that I'm yeah. learning yes at the beginning in the middle yes yeah maybe not so useful when you're working towards taking charge of your own destiny separating yourself out from your history 
Absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a different process, isn't it? But you can only do it if those first parts of sequences of the psychotherapy have happened. I agree with you. Yeah. And you can only do it if the therapist can cope with that, actually. Yeah. So in yeah, I'm quite happy to fall off the pedestal. You are. You are. <laughs> you are. Because you only you've got a sense of humility and humbleness, and you also understand the process. In supervision, when I'm supervising therapists, I'm often talking about this very process we're talking about now. Love. I think it makes you more approachable and more like you touched on it. That human side of the yeah. therapist. Yeah. So those elements make up an effective therapy. And I started off at the beginning with love, kindness, and compassion. Yeah. They have to be there, I think, yes. in yeah. for a successful therapy relationship. Yeah, for ourselves and the client. I loved it when you said that. Yeah, it's for both. We have to yes. allow the therapist to love us, which is usually the hardest thing. Yeah. For the th we have to allow ourselves, right? Sorry, we have to allow our, how can I explain this? We have to allow the clients to love us. Yes, yeah. That often, that often is so hard for therapists for lots of reasons to do maybe their own scripts and their own histories, but also the therapist, unfortunately, in my opinion, can interpret that relational need of expression and love. They can interpret as over dependability over dependence and then i've they done that in the past bob i must admit yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah. they're using me as a crutch or that there's some sort of like you said dependency on me yeah and then what happens is that the psychotherapist often goes into defending a defensive mode in themselves then the client closes down and repeats history mm. There's a relational need for human beings to express love, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, definitely. To love and to, to, to express yeah. it and to receive it. Yeah, Don't absolutely. Yeah. And often, the, and often uh, this is the crux of an effective psychotherapy treatment, actually. That relationship with the therapist and the client is at the heart of cure, I think. Yeah. All clients need a witness on the road, on their road. All clients need somebody on their road to their personal achievements. I like that. And that's what we are, aren't we? A witness. Mm -hmm. A witness to the change in the journey. Yeah. That's another really important element, isn't it? Yeah. I do like that. That touched me, that. That we, we you know, it's an honour to be a witness to. Yeah. On the journey. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully we make an impact on the way as well. What a lovely place to end, Bob, on this penultimate one of the year. I I, I don't know what we're going to do next session. <laughs> well, first of all, you have a great Christmas. <laughs> you too, absolutely. And to the listeners, if you celebrate Christmas, then hope it's a good one. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm thinking the title that we've got written down here is life after therapy <laughs> might be quite a good one for ending the year <laughs> yeah yeah that would be a very good one for ending the year and we can have the excitement like a christmas present of the second one but i, I like that title yeah because times we need to I'm not gonna explain this we need to give ourselves a vision of okayness after therapy. Yeah. Because ultimately it does need to come to an end at some point. I know, I know for you, Bob, you've been going for a long, long, long time. Oh, this retreat <laughs> I'm talking about, it's the last one is in March. After it would be 14 years then. So after four, and it's going to end in March. Wow, is it? Yeah. Has to have an ending. I mean, the leader's 77. Oh, the bless. The person in the group is 87. Most people are in the 70s. There was a couple oh, I love of... that, Bob. It's like a... <laughs> should make a film about that. That's amazing. Yeah. Like the Thursday Murder Club. <laughs> read those, ever read those books by Richard Osmond. 
where, which is actually based in a and are they called elderly homes anymore or whatever it, what they're called and they 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 <laughs> they create a club um and they're all in their 70s 80s and 90s and they're they're solving murders and things like that but anyway so the youngest i think youngest two people were sort of 57 or 58 and the majority were in late 60s 70s and some of the 87 and um yeah so it'll be a it'll be a, an emotional ending but a, and an ending that is no, you know how can I explain it's like the circle the completion of a journey for me yeah yeah I'm not sure how I will end but I do know that I need to honor the journey where I've come where we all come and everything that goes with that absolutely what an ending to have the life so the title of that what you just said life after therapy yes is a interesting podcast which i'm more than happy to be involved in i'm so pleased that you'll be here bob <laughs> okie doke until next time yeah take care and see you next time absolutely bye bye bye, -bye. bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.